Well, today is the conclusion to our series that we've been doing entitled Away in a Manger. As we've been talking about all these different characters that were there and present as part of the Christmas story. I pray that it, this whole experience for you has, has helped you to grow like it's helped me to grow. It's wild to me that all these years, you know, Blaine, this is like 30-some years of coming back to the Christmas story at Christmas, you know. You'd think pretty soon it'd just be get old hat. But it's like every year God shows me something new. Every year it's like I never thought of it or never saw it that way. I pray that this series has been that way for you. As we've shown you things like the... Like, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Today, we're going to finish our story appropriately with some characters from the Bible, some, some individuals that are part of the story, known as the wise men. The wise men are perfect for today because the wise men, technically, un, un, unfamiliar to what we know as the Christmas story we see our kids do in the play and everything for years and years and the way that we were raised, the wise men were the ones who were the late to the party. They did not arrive at, um, opposing what we've seen in the, all the, the dramas. They weren't there when the shepherds were there. They weren't there when Jesus was laying in a manger. They had not arrived yet. I was reading a, a, a document the other day, or a, a statement, and, and this is what it said, just giving you a little brief synopsis. It says, The wise men traveled to Bethlehem from the eastern lands, somewhere on the other side of the Arabian desert. So they were quite a ways away from where Jesus was. They did not merely wander or let the wind blow them in a haphazard direction without intent. No. They came with purpose, following the signs, and they came to see and to honor and to anoint a true royalty, one that had been prophesied from long ago. They were coming with gifts prepared to honor a king. You know, in Matthew, Matthew's gospel, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Um, in Matthew's gospel, he records the story of the wise men uh, like this, beginning in ch uh, chapter 2, verse number 1. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, and, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> start again. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? who has been born king of the Jews. In other words, they came to Herod, the king of the Jews, because they had seen a sign that they had read about that historically was going to appear when this king of the Jews was going to appear. So they went to Herod. Of course, he's the king. He'll know. So they go to king. They say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? When Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, Herod, inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, well, it's historically written in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared and then sent them, being the wise men, to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child and when you have found him, bring me word that I may too, that I too may come and worship him. Well, after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Notice this. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures. They offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Heavenly Father, 
In these last few minutes, I pray that you will help uh, this humble servant to clearly and succinctly express this message you've laid on my heart. There is such power in the story of Christmas. It is that, that, that focal point from which all eternal life flows. Help me, God, to do it justice this morning. Let our ears hear what the Spirit wants to say. In Jesus' name. Tracing the ancient origins of words can, can lead a person to some pretty interesting revelations. I know some folks around, uh, in the church are real into studying. I've, I've heard from, I've heard from uh, Whitney talking about Max. She says, we were talking about it the other day. Uh, by the way, some of you have asked uh, about whether we're going to be starting uh, uh, School of Missions, School of Ministry back up, Carlsbad School of Ministry, CSOM. And yes, we will be starting it back up in February. Um, 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 Mac and I guess also Whitney have graciously committed to helping us to move that, that program forward. So, but we were talking about that. and I was talking to Whitney about studying and preparing. She says, oh, Mac, she says, I, I'm the kind of person, I, just, I like one Bible that's got a lot of study notes and, and it helps me, but not Mac. He's like surrounded by books. He's in everything. He's reading this and he's reading that because he wants to get down deep into it. Sometimes it's powerful to get down, to dig in deep. You remember a couple weeks ago when I talked about Shalom? Anybody remember that? Did, that? did that sink into you about that word? Did it impact you like it did me? To get deep into that word, when you realize that when you say to a Jewish person, Shalom, you're saying God's ultimate and very best good to you. Now and forever. I mean, it's not just saying, hey, have a good day. That's saying, I want you to have the very best that God could possibly produce in your life today and tomorrow and the next day. I want God to give you God's best. You know, there's power in a word. This morning, there's a word that pops up in the scripture that we're going to take a look at. It's a, it's a word that we're all familiar with if we're Christians. And even if we're not Christians, we're familiar with this word. Um, the newborn baby is referred to here in Matthew, in verse number 4, as the Christ. Christ. That's a word we all know, right? You know, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, also includes this the birth narrative of Jesus, and it talks to about him this way. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You can take that to the next slide. Next slide. There we go. And then we go on to the next one, and it says, uh, For... Um, uh, the book of the genealogy of, I'm sorry, yeah, that's probably what threw her off. I, I went past one. Um, also in, the, in Matthew in chapter 1, it said, it described the entire book of Matthew is going to be the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Christ. And the next one, born this day in the city of David, is the Savior. He is Christ the Lord, that word Christ, the, the, if you trace the ancient origins of that word, you'll find that the English word for Christ was branched from the Latin word Christus, which actually was branched from the Greek translation of Christos. So it's got a rich heritage here. But you dive even deeper into the soil of history and you'll discover that what those words really meant was to be anointed or to be for oil, it was a symbol of oil being poured out or to be anointed. And this word was used in order to describe the anointing process of a sovereign king. It was tradition all through time that when a new king was, was brought to the people and it was announced, this is going to be the next king or this is now your new king, part of that process, like a, like a marriage ceremony, is the process of anointing. They would bring to that king very special gifts, gifts of high value, gifts that expressed um, the, the, the surrender of wealth, the surrender of life, and then an anointing that would now say, you are the king. That's what normally happened when they went to find a king. Well, when these, when these wise men were showing up to see Jesus, guess what the three gifts they were bringing were for? 
They were the gifts that were brought in a traditional ceremony process of honoring a new king. They went there to anoint the new king of Israel. Let that soak in for a minute. They weren't, they weren't coming there for some religious reason. It was the anointing. It was the tradition. And the posture we see historically in royal anointing practices, it's the same posture we see as these, these wise men arrive in Matthew to find the Jesus, to find Jesus. Jesus Christ, Jesus was his name. Christ was his title. You see this? Jesus was his given name. You will have a son, and you will name him Jesus. He didn't say you will name him Jesus Christ. No, because Christ isn't part of his name. Jesus is his name. Christ was his title that was to be given to him as the true king of the Jews. Now, this is a powerful revelation, so do not miss this, because this is what makes this so, this starts to bring this together and help us to see what's so powerful about this. These were wise learned men that came to find Jesus. They were not religious people, and they were not rabbis. They didn't come to find some king of the Jew, Messiah, that they had read up and taught since they were children. They were just wise men who studied things, and they had studied the Jewish traditions, and they were the ones, isn't it interesting, that the ones who weren't looking for a Messiah were the ones that actually saw the signs and recognized them for what they were. In fact, later on, when, when, uh, when Herod says he brings forth the high priests and the religious leaders together, what does it say they're feeling? They're worried. They're concerned. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, I remember those stories. I remember that part of the things that we learned years ago. But this is going to mess up the apple cart. We got a good thing going here. We got Herod, and we're, we're his top guys, and the things are rolling. And, you know, we like our religion just like it is. Let's don't, God, don't come in and mess it up. Hello? But it was wise men, people who, who weren't necessarily looking for spiritual answers. They were just following the signs. And for weeks, probably months, possibly even a year, they traveled across the country. And don't you know in that time, they spent a lot of time talking about what this sign was about. They spent a lot more time studying and learning. Maybe they weren't religious people, but I got a feeling that before they ever arrived to see Jesus, there was, a, there was faith already building inside of their hearts. How long can you hear about this story and search it out? If, if they hadn't had faith growing in them, would they have really kept on the journey? Would they, would they continue? I just have to, I may be wrong, but, uh, um, you know, there was that one time I was wrong. <laughs> I got a feeling that something was growing in them. They may not have understood it because they didn't grow up with that kind of teaching, but, they, but the more they studied it and the more they realized the miracle of this, and then as they watched, it said after they left Herod, they went to him thinking he didn't have the answers. He didn't have the answers, so they packed up, and the Scripture says when they left Herod, the star started going before them, right? That's what it said. So in other words, it's kind of like back in, the, back in the desert when they had the fire by night and the cloud by day that led the nation of Israel. Well, they had this, this star that would go, okay, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. No farther, Pastor, you'll fall off the edge. And then the star stopped and basically showed them exactly where the baby was. He wasn't in some bright, shining stall manger with a bunch of shepherds gathered around and everybody celebrating and angels gathered around and singing. No. What did the scripture say? Where did they find him? In a house. By the time they found Jesus, he, the family had moved to Bethlehem. They'd moved into a house. They were, they were going all about their, their lives. And the star brought them to their home, to your house this afternoon. You hear that ding dong, it's not UPS, <laughs> right? Isn't that weird that they're delivering stuff on Sundays now? It's so weird for me. I get a doorbell ring on Sunday. Well, oh, somebody's coming by to say hi. A box. They come to a door 
And it's just a simple house and simple dwelling, but they know there's something there. And when they enter in, it, the way it describes it, it was three people who recognized that this was no ordinary child. They recognized that this was exactly what was said to be. And in that day, in that place, they, the non-spiritual wise men, anointed the true king of Israel in that moment. You know, uh, somebody's giving me a hard time today. <coughs> well, I won't get into that right now. <laughs> You'll get it here in a minute. It was a silent moment. It was a quiet setting. Not only had these men traveled for so far, possibly over a year, they brought gifts for a king, but they didn't really know what this king really meant until they got there. N.T. Wright wrote, the gifts that the Magi brought were the sort of things that people in the ancient world would think of as appropriate to present, to bring to human kings or even to gods. Little did they know that day as they walked into that room, this was no ordinary king and this wasn't a little g god. But this was the savior of the world. That those same things they had been studying would prophesy to as well. The glowing angels singing Hosanna, the shepherds gathered around the manger, the hoopla, it's all past. The night is quiet and silent. It certainly was a holy moment for the wise men when they finally viewed the one they had heard about and traveled to see for many miles. But soon, as he lay sleeping in the silence of Bethlehem, the night while he still could sleep, things were about to change. Isn't that the way life tends to be? Everything gets calm and you think, we're finally done. And the whole time, something's brewing in the background, getting ready to break. Soon the fake king of the Jews, Herod, would send his soldiers on an errand that would break the silent night into screams of horror. Herod had summoned the wise men to inquire, and when he had heard that they had seen the star, the Jewish sign of the arrival, he said, when did you see the star? Why? Because Herod was panicking. His leaders were panicking. What if one prophesied about truly had come? What if he was about to be uh, kicked out as king? What if he was about to be removed? Would he push Herod aside? Would the people drive Herod out? This was a bad thing for Herod. So when he asked, where did you see the star? He, when he said, let me know where he is so I can come and worship him, it wasn't to come and accept him as the new king. It was to come and to take out his rival. And that's just what he did. Because he didn't get a chance, because they hadn't come back and told him, he just started doing the math in his head. You saw on the star on this day, that means the child would be between this age and this age. And so I, here's my order. Throughout all, every child born in Bethlehem, that's from this age to this age, every male child is to be killed, murdered, every one of them. If I can't, I'll get the right one by killing all of them. This is how I'll deal with the king of the Jews. On the night the silence was broken in Bethlehem by Herod's soldiers, God was still a step ahead, like he always is. Listen to me. God is always a step ahead. What did I say earlier when we were praying? God always has a plan. He's always ready. He's never caught off guard. Herod, he had no clue. He thought he was so smart. And all he was was a dirty, rotten murderer. And he didn't get what he wanted. Why? Because before he got there, Jesus spoke to Joseph and said, time for you to take your wife and get out. And of all places to go back to, Egypt, <laughs> not the place you want to call home as a Jew. The Lamb of God, then in that quiet place of solitude, would grow up from a little boy to a young man and then into a man. And one day, his time of ministry would come. In the span of three years, 
he would change the face of the earth forever. Everything that had been prophesied about for generation upon generation upon generation, all these mysteries, all these prophetic words people wrestled with trying to fully understand, and Jesus unfolded it. In three years, he answered literally all of the hidden mysteries about the Messiah. It was so weird for them that as, they, as the disciples that walked with him and they watched, they, even when Jesus was telling them, this has to happen, this has to be this way, and they were still going, I, but I don't see how. This doesn't work. It's got to be a different way. This doesn't make sense. His closest followers denied him, separated him because they were frustrated by him. The one who betrayed him betrayed him because he wasn't doing the things the way that he thought he was supposed to be doing it, not recognizing that Jesus was simply fulfilling exactly what the Father had said all along. Through all the turmoil, all the ups and downs, through the death of the children in Herod, through the, through the struggles and the battles against the Pharisees after he'd grown up and began his ministry, all through the chaos and the noise and the racket, there had always been, and there will always be, both then, now, and tomorrow, will always be a place of solitude in God. For God's children, who are paying attention to the signs and the promises that God has given, you will find peace in the silence of your night. He will give you a star that will guide you to exactly where you need to be, just on time. And the chaos and all that will come and go around you will never change who he really is. The wise men saw something very special that day. Take a look. Great light shines best in great darkness. That is a lesson we learned as we traveled many miles in the darkness of night. And I know, I know, nighttime is the most dangerous time to travel. However, there's a great degree of difficulty in following a star in the daylight. <laughs> uh, we were looking for royalty. So we had no idea what we were going to find. Eh? I've been in the outer courts of princes and kings, noisy assemblages these, hangers on on every corner, quarters of favor, making endless rackets, scheming, chattering, everyone wanting an audience with nobility. And none of that here. No, no, no. Here, silence. Lingering. Calm, awestruck silence. Here, a newborn, wrapped in cloths and lying in a feeding trough. There were two milk goats standing silently behind him. Chickens pecked on the ground. An exhausted woman and a humble man. And outside, shepherds. Shepherds timidly watching. And all are silent. We dare not say a word. We bow down. We worship. And we gently lay our gifts on the ground. I've spent the bulk of my days searching for the truth of it all, trying to make sense of this life. But that search, it was different. That time, while we were searching, we were also being led, not, not merely by a star, 
but by the hand of Almighty God. He led us. He led us to the one in whom all truth rests. He led us to a child, a baby, a king. Sing it together. wise man in the video talked about how <clears throat> as they were trying to get where they were going, they were led. Did you catch that in the video? He said, we were led to that place. I want to speak this over each and every one of you today, especially as you get ready to launch into a brand new year. Listen, that, let's just be honest with ourselves. We don't always cut the mustard. We don't always make it up to the bar. We don't always live the way that we should live. We don't always make the right choices. We, we feel like the apostle said, the things I should do, I shouldn't be doing. And I don't do the things I should. What a wretched person I am. Who can save me from me? We all know what that feels like to not always be at our best, but you need to know something today. That same apostle answered his own question in the same breath when he, in the very next words, he said, who can save me from me? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Those wise men were not prepared. They were not spiritually ready, yet they were still being led. Listen to me carefully this morning. You don't have to Earn a position of spirituality before God cares about you and will take the time to invest into your life. You don't have to be a perfect person. You don't. You could be living in sin and you know it's sin and you know it grieves the heart of God and you need to know this. God doesn't reject you because of your sin. He will eventually reject your sin. But He will never reject you. He will always hope, 
always strive, always try. And so even today, He is trying to lead you somewhere if you'll yield and follow. The disciples, the, the, I mean the wise men that day, they came to anoint a king. But it wasn't until they got to their destination that they realized this was no ordinary king. I love the look on that guy's face, of that last part, that twinkle in his eye, when he understood this isn't just a king. This is the Messiah. He is the answer to everything broken in your life. And so just like the wise men came driven by their hunger for knowledge, they were blessed to discover something greater. May today and tomorrow and the rest of this year be a quest, a journey for you where you will continue to pursue whatever it is that God has for you. Maybe you don't know where you're going. Maybe you're feeling a little lost. Maybe you don't have the gumption. You don't have the motivation to stay on track. You aren't feeling spiritual. You're not feeling spiritually driven. That's okay. They didn't feel spiritually driven. But if you will simply take the opportunity to follow the signs, I believe I can say this with 100% accuracy. You are going to have a face-to-face -face encounter with God like never before, somewhere along that path. Stay on the path. Follow the signs. Trust them. Don't listen to your mind. Trust your spirit. And may this be the year where the noise and the chaos is shattered by the silence of the presence of, of a Messiah, a Savior, Christ, your King. Father, today, I thank you for the incredible story of Christmas and for reminding us of how real and practical this, this story that happened centuries ago, how real and practical it is, still is today for each and every one of us. None of us is going to go out today and see a star that's going to guide us over some barn somewhere and we're going to go inside and find a baby in a manger. It's not going to happen. That was, that was the story foretold in Matthew and Luke. But, God, there are going to be days where there, that spiritual star, that, that divine guiding light is going to be a present in our lives. And if we will simply pay attention to the signs, I am confident that, God, you're not done leading us to the manger. You're not done leading us to the miracle. You're not done leading us to the Messiah so that we can come face to face with the one who is truly our King and who can overcome all, who can give us silence and peace in the midst of the chaos. Help us, God, right now to make the determination, not me, in 2020. Not me. I will not be waver. I will not be distracted. I will not give up. I will not grow angry. I will not separate myself from the promises of God. They are my promises. They are yea and amen. We say it in worship, and I believe it. Those are my promises, God. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on the signs. Until one day, you break through the noise. Bless each person. Bless each household. And God, bless this, your house. We ask in Jesus' name.